From the first century onwards, deities were created in Indian art for meditation and worship. The belief was in the oneness of all of creation. The separated forms of the world were maya, or illusions. The truth was beyond all forms. However, the deities provided familiar shapes which were easier for the mind to grasp. By the 5th century, sublime deities were made in central or north India. Though they were in human form, their purpose was to move us through their grace and beauty to transcend the world of forms, to leave behind our attachments and desires. From the 2nd century BC in the Western Deccan, hundreds of great shrines and monasteries had been carved out of the heart of the mountains in the Western Ghats. The magnificent site of Ajanta was in the horseshoe-shaped gorge of the Vaghora River. In the mid-5th century, under the rule of the Hindu Vakataka kings, it saw renewed activity. As in the Indic tradition seen earlier, in the Western and Eastern Deccan, feudatories, ministers and even queens freely followed the Buddhist faith. There were no religious divisions and the patrons of the Buddhist caves sometimes proclaimed their descent from Hindu gods. The facades of earlier Chetyagrihas presented a grand simplicity. The second phase of Ajanta brings us a changed world. Cave 19 of the mid-5th century is the first Chetyagriha, or Hall of Meditation, of the Vakataka period. The facade of the hall is thickly populated with divine forms. The horseshoe-shaped window above the entrance, based upon wooden architectural models, has become more elaborate. On either side of the window are made attendant figures. They stand in graceful postures and the treatment is delicate. Buddhas are made flanking the entrance to the cave. On the right, the Buddha offers to his son Rahula his rightful inheritance, the promise of salvation or Buddhahood. On the left of the entrance, he makes a similar gesture of the offer of grace, the promise of enlightenment. The figures have a humanity and sensitivity which gives Ajanta a special place in Indian art. The garments are diaphanous. There is a grace and an inward look which is the hallmark of the sculpture of this period. A Nagaraja and a Nagini with an attendant figure are among the finest sculptures of Ajanta. These are serpents made in human form and such images come from the earliest times in Indian art. They have that rapt concentration and inward look which catches us immediately and takes us to a place of peace deep within. The figures are closely similar in style to the ones at the Hindu temple at Diogar in Uttar Pradesh. Earlier, the interior of the hall of meditation was simple and unadorned. The focus was on the final truth, which was formless. 
Now it is the beauty of form which serves to reveal the grace which underlies creation. Peace is now created by beauty and harmony around us. Though the stupa continues to be made, it is very considerably elaborated. The Buddha stands at the front to bestow his blessing upon the worshipper. Cave 26 is a grand Chetyagraha, perhaps the last excavation at Ajanta. It is much larger and more elaborate than Cave 19. The Buddha inside is again made within a stupa and sits with pendant legs upon a throne. The Maitreya Buddha, who is as yet to come in the world, is often made in this fashion. The circumambulatory path around the shrine is elaborately carved. On the left wall is a marvellous depiction of the Buddha's victory over the armies of Mara. These forces represent the turbulence and confusion of the mind. Mara's daughters below represent our desires, which keep us bound to a life of pain in the material world. The Buddha is serene as he rises above all these and is ready for enlightenment. A profoundly moving scene is that of the Mahaparinirvana of the Buddha, when he finally achieves release from the mortal world. This is one of the grandest, yet most sensitive depictions in all of Buddhist art. The figure of the reclining Buddha is about 22 feet long and is best seen from near his feet the appropriate position for the devotee. The perspective has been perfectly made for viewing from this spot. Ananda, his grieving disciple, also sits at his feet, desolate at the loss, forlorn. In the solemnity and grandeur of the noble achievement of the Mahapari Nirvana, Ananda adds a human touch, which is unforgettable. The same sentiment is echoed in some of the seated figures of monks below the Buddha. Above, heavenly musicians celebrate the great moment of the Buddha's release from the world of illusions. A number of grand viharas for the residence of monks were excavated in this period. These are considerably larger than the earlier viharas and are profusely painted. In fact, practically every inch of wall and ceiling space was originally covered with fine paintings. Early literature has many references to such halls of murals. These at Ajanta are extremely valuable as they are the only surviving significant body of early paintings. These exquisite murals are also amongst the greatest treasures of the entire heritage of Indian art. The addition of shrines in the viharas is a new feature which is seen in this period at Ajanta. The resident monks could now worship the Buddha and meditate before him in the vihara itself. The shrine has an antechamber which prepares us for entry into the sacred space. The growing complexity of iconography is seen. Besides the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, in the upper floor of Cave 6, the shrine also has six Manushi Buddhas, 
who preceded Gautam Buddha. The Buddha figure and other sculptures here recall the grace and transcendent qualities of the art of the Gupta Empire further north. The forms are more full-bodied here. While the hammer and chisel sounded in the gorge of the Vaghora River, work was also taken up again at the site of Kanheri within present-day Mumbai. In the late 5th and 6th centuries, a number of older caves were modified and new excavations were made. Kanheri became the largest rock-cut cave site in India, with over a hundred caves. On either side of the veranda of the early Cave 3 were made colossal Buddhas, over 22 feet high. This is the beginning of the tradition of Brihad, or colossal Buddhas, which spread near and far. They display the gesture of the bestowing of grace. Vidyadharas bring garlands to them. By the 4th century, the method of yoga, or yoga tantra, was established in Indic thought. It was a graded path of evolution through discipline and meditation. In the art of the Buddhist faith, Cave 90 of the early 6th century has the earliest representation of the mandala, which represents such a graded path. The Buddha at the center represents the final or universal truth. The Buddhas and other figures around him are the personifications of wisdom and compassion, which lead us to the ultimate knowledge at the center. In K41 of the late 5th or early 6th century, is the first known depiction of the Bodhisattva Avlokiteshvara with eleven heads. The ten Bodhisattva heads, leading to the final Buddha head above, represent the gradual ascent to enlightenment. At Aurangabad, not very far from Ajanta, another group of caves was excavated in the 6th century. The earlier caves here are contemporaneous to Ajanta and seem to continue the sculptural traditions of that site. There are very fine carvings seen on the pillars of Cave 3. In the later caves here, sculptural panels are increasingly used to carry the iconographic message. A litany of Avlokiteshvara and panels of other bodhisattvas are made at the entrance to the circumambulatory passage of the shrine. Further inside, to the left of the entrance to the shrine itself, is made a panel of Tara with attendants. These are early depictions of the increasing number of deities which were being created in the Yogacharya development of Mahayana Buddhism. The worshipper meditated upon the aspects of the Buddha that were personified in these deities. On the left wall of the shrine is made a dancer with six musicians. This is one of the finest sculptural depictions in the caves of this period. As seen from the first century onwards, the depiction of deities was a pan-religious development in Indic art. The most wondrous Hindu excavation of the 6th century is on Gharapani Island in Mumbai Harbour. The island is popularly known as Elephanta on account of a large stone elephant 
which the Portuguese had found at the entrance. Well, Elephant is one of the great wonders of early Indian art. It's totally mysterious to us. We don't know who paid for it. We imagine somebody must have, that it maybe it had a royal patron. Scholars cannot decide who commissioned it, when exactly it was executed, or for what reason. These are not known to us, may never be known to us. What are left are these damaged but hugely impressive panels carved out of this sort of basalt, this sort of difficult rock that doesn't allow much detail. And these figures are among the most impressive that we have. And we still experience the mystery of this three-faced torso of Shiva emerging out of the mountain as we walk into the great cave. The Shiva cave here is dug out of the rock on a vast scale. It is about 125 by 125 feet. The entrance is unadorned. So also is the spacious hall inside. It is an effect of monumental scale and large free spaces in between great sculptural panels. To the west of the Mandapa is the main shrine with a linga and yoni, representing the unity of all creation. The final completeness which is beyond the world of forms. The shrine has entrances on all four sides, flanked by monumental dwarapalas. They are graceful and have the fullness of the earlier forms in the western Indian caves. The heavy lower lips and the rapt inward concentration are characteristic of the depictions at Elephanta. On the south wall of the cave is made a profoundly moving representation of Lord Shiva. The light coming from the three distant entrances of the caves creates a dramatic setting. The image emerges from a dark void as a manifestation of the unmanifest eternal. It is made on a three-foot high platform and rises another 18 feet above that. The image is more a mukhalinga than a figure of Shiva. The face on the proper right is the terrible or wrathful representation of Lord Shiva. He has snakes and skulls in his hair, an angry brow and twisted moustache. On the proper left is the blissful and gentle face of Shiva as Vamadeva or of Shiva's spouse Parvati. The central face presents the deeply contemplative aspect of the Lord. The stillness beyond all movement. The peace of deep knowledge. The cave has eight monumental depictions of the themes of Lord Shiva made in panels. On the left of the great central image, is Shiva's manifestation as Ardhnarishwar. Here we see the unification of the male and female principles in creation. Most reliefs were considerably damaged when the Portuguese military garrison here used to practice artillery fire in the hall. On the right is the depiction of Shiva as he catches the personified river Ganga in his hair on her descent from heaven. He breaks the terrible impact of her fall which could wash away the earth. The art of Elephanta presents the inward search which is the hallmark of this time known as the Gupta and post-Gupta periods in Indian art. 
there is a sense of great dynamism contained in the stillness. In the words of art historian J.C. Harl, these figures convey the essential oneness of the human and the divine. Greek gods are simply men and women, albeit idolized. These figures are superhuman, true divinities. The link with the human world achieved by plastic form in a way never perhaps equaled. The journey of Indian art has brought us to a point where the human form is used to convey ideas which transcend our mortal existence. The subject of the art is the depiction of the essence and not only the optical reality of the world. As stated in the ancient treatise, the Chitra Sutra, the depiction of harmony and beauty has a transforming influence upon the viewer. When we respond to beauty, for that moment, we come out of ourselves. Our worldly cares and concerns are left behind. In that moment, we are absorbed in the grace which is everywhere in creation. Mm-hmm.